what you wouldn't see is any evidence at all that humans have noticed climate change. I'm just going to start by looking at the kind of physical dimensions of the challenges that we face. So here it is, I'm just going to give a very, very quick sort of taste of it. Just to map out a few of them, we've obviously got a climate emergency and an, e and an energy transition that's you know, really strongly linked to that, and I'll say just a couple of words about that in a minute. Whilst we deal with all that, we've got a biodiversity challenge which is actually just as serious, but it doesn't get anything like the airtime. And while we deal with that, of course, we've got the little detail of we've got to, uh, we've got to feed everybody in a, and the population's rising while we're at it. And we've got to do that whilst dealing with the incredible amount of every kind of pollution you can think of. Um, plastics is one of them, but yeah, a, ton, a ton of other pollutants as well. Uh, and of course, we've been hearing and feeling a lot about disease threat that we've, we've also got. So it's a kind of, you know, it's a lot of things to deal with all at once. And one of the things we've got to get a lot better at is joining up our thinking on all of that. Before I go any further, I've got some, this is going to be, an is it an optimistic talk? I think it's, in a way, it's an opti I hope it's an optimistic talk. Depends on where your start point is. If your start point is that you think we're basically fine and it's, we, can, we can carry on, those environmentalists have always banged on a bit and it's always been fine to, broadly speaking, ignore them and decade after decade we're always fine. If that's where you're coming from, then this is not an optimistic talk. If where you're coming from is that we are, you, you've convinced yourself that the situation is hopeless and humans are just fundamentally so messed up that we can't possibly get through this, then I think, I, I, I think this is an optimistic talk. But the headline on all this stuff is that uh, it turns out that from a science and technology point of view, we've got the solutions. I'm not, I don't want to belittle how complex and how difficult it is to implement them, but if it was only about working through uh, with good intention what the science and technology were telling us about these problems and, and finding the solutions, you know, we'd do it. We'd be right on top of all of this. So I've left a lot of space in the middle to talk about what's maybe the crux of the problem. But before we get into it, I, um, before we get into the middle stuff, I'm just going to give a, a few words on some of the stuff, some of the words in green there. So first up, a little bit on energy and climate. So there's the, there's the global energy use curve that's going up and up, and up but it's 2.4% per year. That's taken us to such a dangerous, dangerous position. And one of the things we hear a lot from, from the fossil fuel companies at the moment is they're talking about, you know, the, well, you know, they're helping us to deal with humankind's rising energy demand, you know, rising energy needs. And that, that needs a complete reframe. We don't, ha we don't have rising energy needs. Humankind can get away with using a lot less energy than we use today, even though there are some parts of the world that actually need to use, um, that actually n probably have a, just a good case for using more more energy but here in the in the UK for example we can get away with using a lot less uh, lo a lot less energy than we do at the moment and we're all the time we're getting efficiency improvements but we're not bagging the savings from them okay I just want to highlight a couple of things about this carbon curve that's just carbon emissions from fossil fuel use so if you were on Mars looking at data about Earth asking yourself how are humans getting on what's been their story for the last few years you would notice a few things you'd notice that there was a you'd notice we'd had a, some events in the in, in the last in the last um, 30 years or so you'd notice the dissolution of the Soviet Union you'd notice a little dip for a global financial crisis You'd notice, the biggest, you'd notice a, a little temporary dip for the pandemic. But what you wouldn't see is any evidence at all that humans have noticed climate change. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying this uh, to be pessimistic, because, I'm, because by noticing this, it tells us a lot about what does and doesn't solve the problem. So you could argue this looks as though it might be tailing off, but if you do the maths and stats on it, there's no statistical significance in that at all. It's entirely consistent with emissions going um, up and up and up, you know, on a, on a rising curve that's been averaging 1.8% per year in a remarkably mathematically exponential way for about 160 years uh, at least. So why is that? Because we all know, I bet this room's full of people who try and cut their carbon at least sometimes, and the, the government's talking about stuff, and I know, work with loads of businesses that got targets. How come you can't see any faint, you can't see a trace of a dent in that curve yet? Well, unfortunately, it's to do with the, the dynamics of how, 
of how things are working at the moment. And you could call it, I sometimes call it the balloon squeezing effect or the rebound effect. But the way that the dynamics work is that if you try and deal with climate change by just sort of squeezing the carbon emissions in a few places at once, what happens is, unfortunately, it creates a tendency for the slack to get taken up elsewhere. In other words, you know, if you cut your carbon footprint and that's all you do, the reality is it creates a tendency for someone else to have a bit of a bigger carbon footprint. And the, real and the, uh, the sum total of it all so far is nothing. I'm not saying that to mean don't bother trying to be responsible with your, with your own personal carbon emissions. I do think that's part of what we can all do. But what I'm saying is that somehow we need to do it in such a way that we're helping to create the conditions under which the whole balloon can be squeezed at once. In other words, the whole of humanity can bring about a systemic, a systemic change um, that leaves the fossil fuel in the ground and deals with all the other environmental issues that we've got as well. Which takes us on to the kind of real heart of the question, because none of this is rocket science at all so far. And you know, this is the most fascinating bit of it all, of course, is the, is the human reaction to it. To be optimistic, I think the evidence that we might slowly, slowly be getting to the point where we're suddenly ready to wake up is stronger, a lot stronger than it was maybe two or three, maybe two or three years ago. Okay, more, more optimistic stuff. I said that the science, from a science and technology perspective, uh, we, could, we could do this. So I know this is a bit simplistic, but that dot is to scale, and it represents the size of the solar panels that we would need to replace the whole of today's energy supply. And it's about 200 and something miles by 200 and something miles. Now, clearly, there's a lot of devil in the detail. We've got to produce the solar panels, and that's got... Uh, that's got an environmental cost and not everybody has sunlight and it, it, the sun's not always shining and somehow you've got to get it to everybody when they need it, where they need it. Uh, and so there's other technologies that we need like hydrogen and wind and a whole load of different stuff. But when you look at all of those and the first kind of there's about 50 pages in No Planet B devoted to that stuff, it all turns out to be broadly speaking doable. But just to illustrate, I said that it's no good, uh, it's no good uh, if our energy supply is still rising, if we stay on the, the rate at which we're growing our energy use at the moment, um, that's what it looks like now. That's what it would look like in 100 years. We'd need 10 of those dots. In 200 years, we'd need 100 of those dots. And in 300 years, we'd need every single scrap of land in the world to be covered in solar panels. And you couldn't have a human with sunlight landing on them because that would be casting a shadow on a solar panel that we'd need for our energy supply. So it's just a kind of an illustration. But you know, I get depressed in a way when I see renewables uh, going up at the moment because they are actually doing us no good whatever. They only do us good if they replace the fossil fuel. And the evidence is that you know, it doesn't happen on its own. What you need to separately do is come to an arrangement to constrict the carbon emissions. You actually need to, uh, something separate to leave the fuel in the ground. Which is, this guy is so obvious, but um, we, sti we still gloss over it with you know, uh, um, climate policies that are all about renewables, but actually don't deal with um, making sure the fuel stays in the ground. Okay, um, so the big, the big renewable uh, energy source is, is sunlight. The, the other ones are in there, but they're not as important. So let's have a look at who gets that sunlight, because in this carb low carbon transition, we're going to have the problem of sharing, uh, which I'll talk about slightly in a moment. <laughs> so this map is to scale, it's a squidgy map. And so the size of each country is, represents how much sunlight lands on it. And the color scheme represents the amount of sunlight per person. Dark is good. So there's Australia with 200 times more sunlight per person than the UK. Here's the UK looking very pale and skinny up there with the fifth worst major country in the world for this. We're just ahead of Bangladesh, Rwanda, Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, in, terms of, in terms of sunlight per person per head. But there's a whole question of how we're going to share out the renewable energy when we've got it. This question of how we're going to share is going to be so critical because this is a global problem. Uh, so let's have a look. You know, this, is what, this is who owns the fossil fuel, the top 10 countries with the 10 greatest fossil fuel reserves. And I've mapped up against it who's got the, who's got the sunlight. 
And broadly speaking, they, they match up quite nicely, actually. It turns out not to be a coincidence, because if you think of how, how fossil fuels got formed, it required sunlight and so on. Um, but there's still this huge question of when we make that transition, how is that transition going to be acceptable to all, all, these, all these countries? And I think, again, to try and be, if there, is there anything optimistic we could say about Ukraine? Um, you know, one of the big, almost unaskably difficult questions has always been, well, how is the Russian fossil fuel ever going to stay in the ground? I mean, that's always been, un it's still incredibly difficult to come up with a, a way of imagining that taking place. But it feels, to me, it feels, if anything, slightly more possible than it did, um, than it did a few months ago. Okay, so that's all I want to say about, you know, we could talk, I could talk for ages about most of these things, I just want to you know, say about the food and land system, because in fact, the first 50 pages of, of No Planet B is all about that. If you look at where we're up to with the, with the, f with the food system, I mean, we are, we are at the moment, uh, if we could transition to far less meat and dairy in our diet, we could liberate s a lot of spare capacity uh, for looking after the biodiversity that we're hemorrhaging and feeding a rising population and dealing with climate while we're at it uh, and probably getting on top of the fact that the climate is changing making some land less fertile and also we're degrading land so quickly uh, at the moment through our current agricultural uh, our, our current agricultural practices and that's probably you know in terms of the science and technology the food and land stuff is probably the trickiest part of the whole sustainability challenge but it still feels doable Okay, so what would it take for us to be solving these technically solvable challenges? And I think my thinking on this is getting simpler and simpler the more I, the more I think about it. Because I spend a lot of time in debates about things like, you know, really simple questions like, should the UK open up a new coal mine on the west coast of Cumbria? I mean, it's, you know, it's so, <laughs> it's so clear cut. And yet the arguments for it get put in such sophisticated ways and they're so disingenuous and they're so hard to unpick that I've wasted months of my life on just that one question. Other people have wasted even more time than that. And we, you know, there's something going wrong. It's not that the analysis can't be done. It's that something else is happening to stop that analysis getting acted on. And that's what we've really, really got to, uh, that's what we've really, really got to, got to get on top of. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.